Laura! Marissa! What time is it? It's Divine Mother Earth time! Woohoo! Hey, Laura. Hey, Marissa. What time is it? It's Divine Mother Earth time. And boy, do we have a great guest. Laura, please tell us all about Maureen. Maureen St. Germain. Wow. We just talked to you recently at the New Life Expo in New York City, which was so amazing to see you in person. And uh, yeah, we we got to just yeah talk with you a bit and ask you some questions. And we have so many more. So we wanted to just gather again, not too long after we just saw you. So I want to share a bit about you, but I want to thank you so much for joining us right here in the middle of holiday season. I am delighted to be here and thank you for inviting me. You know, it's 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 a wonderful opportunity for us to share and for those who are available to be listening and get some really powerful information. Oh, for sure. Okay, so Maureen St. Germain has over 25 years of experience in the area of mystical and sacred traditions. Known as the practical mystic, she is a prolific teacher and facilitator of spiritual knowledge for contemporary life. As an internationally acclaimed Ascension teacher, Maureen has been granted access to a dimension that has been closed to many of humanity for eons, and she is a direct channel to source. She is the founder of St. Germain Mystery School and Akashic Records International. Her annual program, the Ascension Institute, is a highly sought after immersive training for evolving humans. She's also a best-selling author of six books. Uh, um, uh, Amazon bestsellers like Beyond the Flower of Life, Waking Up in 5D, A Practical Guide to Multidimensional Transformation, Mastering Your 5D Self, Waking Up in 5D. What an incredible blessing you are to humanity and what a divine mother. Perfect for divine mother earth time. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so, and I'm the mother of four sons. Oh, wow. Amazing. I know well, you have, mother we're, they're all adults. We're, we're not talking age here, but. Everybody's an adult. I know, at least, Laura, you have two adult sons. So, you know, it's yeah. cool. Very cool. So we have so many questions for you, Maureen, but I wanted to start off with, okay, you talk a lot about the ascension dimension and waking up in 5D. Well, how do we wake up in 5D, which, you know, we have woken up, those of us who have woken up in 5D. <laughs> But how do we stay in 5D? How do we not go to sleep in 3D? I mean, how do we how do we manifest our our existence in 5D and, and not get pulled down to like the 3D? So how do we stay there? How do we stay in 5D? Well, you know, you make a good point because it is a sine wave. We are, you know, elevating up to 5D and then we're dropping back down and we're elevating up and we're dropping back down. So part of it is just recognizing that it's not like getting a driver's license where you, you know, you get permission, you can drive any car you can get your hands on. This is more like you have to borrow a car and you have to get permission. And it's not like permission, permission, but you have to make a choice. You want to wake up in 5D. And it seems obvious, but one of the ways to do this is to announce when you go to bed, I'm waking up in 5D. And okay. it works. It totally works. You know, there have been times that I have gotten up out of bed and then I sat there on the edge of the bed and I could literally feel my vibe change because I'd made that announcement the night before. Wow. Okay. Yeah. The power of words. That is the power of words and intention. Okay. Yeah. Because we can Very have cool. all the thought forms we want, but what are we going to give voice to? Right. So I know you brought up just catching yourself in those moments. And do you feel that if one's consistent enough with catching themselves that they'll begin to notice the world change around them and see a timeline shift? Because even if we can hold that energy, there's still so much turmoil in the world. And I know you That's talked true. about three different earths. So talk yeah. to us about that. Well, first of all, it is a vibrational data set. So we're the one vibing up mm -hmm. and the others are around us. So you can be a fifth dimensional being in a three dimensional interaction. You can have people around you starting to freak out and you're in a calm place. We've all been there where we've had that happen, but that's the contrast between 3D and 5D. Um, in a personal way, when we're uh, worried or upset or concerned about something that drops us back into polarity, because it always means, what is worry about? It's about something that 
I'm thinking might happen. What is fear? Fear is a remembrance of something that did happen. And so those are pulling us out of our place of balance, our place of unconditional love. So we slide in and out of these dimensions. And as you say, Laura, the goal is to stay there all the time. Um, so, so watching the words we use is a big part of that. And in the book, uh, waking up in 5d, I actually make a list of all the words that we use all the time that bring us back down into 3d. And one of them is I have to now mm -hmm. think about how often we say that I have to get ready. I have a radio interview. I have a luncheon date. I better go get in the car and go, go get going. I have this report I need to do for my boss. I have to go pick up the kids. We could say it a different way. And when we start saying it a different way, we literally change our reality. I like getting my kids on time. They're happy and I don't get overcharged. Um, you know, I, I promised my boss I'd get this report in. I need time to do it. You know, all these things change the vibe. It puts power in. Now, what people don't realize is we offer up our personal freedom, our identity, our autonomy, our sovereignty, when we say, I have to, we're just giving it up to the universe. Whoever mm -hmm. wants it can take it. And then wow. we wonder why people take advantage of us. Wow. So it's kind of like when you say, I have to, it's like you're enslaved to something. I have to do this. Mm -hmm. As opposed you to, absolutely I are. To this. I'd love to do this. This is what I really love to do. I'm going to do it. I get it. Mm -hmm. I never thought of it that way, but I mean, yeah. wouldn't you say, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say like the social engineering and just the grooming of humanity to really live in this dualistic thinking, you know, yes. everything about competition, choosing a side when it comes to sports, when it comes to politics, that is almost really ingrained in a person. And Marissa and I were talking earlier about almost people have an addiction to drama. They, they are bound in an addiction sort of way to the 3d that, how how does a person kind of detox from that that would otherwise not be open to this do we just just simply be a resource in the hopes that they'll come around i mean or uh -huh. if we hold the frequency they'll eventually get it and we're just waiting for them to have that wake gotcha. up call i mean you have Sorry. a lot of people gravitating towards your teaching so you must yeah. see all sides of that so what is that like yeah. yeah i agree that um there is a there is a benefit to just holding that frequency and letting people level up but it is also true that it is it is a little bit uh tiring but the thing is it's only tiring if we accidentally slip down to their level because when we're in our state of bliss when we're in that 5d state nothing bothers us it's like when you fall in love and and you you're thinking about your beloved all the time and you know somebody drives their car in an awkward way in front of you you just Oh, they, they're probably in a hurry. And you don't even think about how you are glossing over their um, 3D behavior, let's say. And so part of it is your presence will help level up everything else. The other part of it is uh, clearing work that we do a lot of here. And that is we keep the energies um, light and full of love because Everyone who is a light bearer is under attack in some way. And so it's not just willpower. You know, it's like sometimes people say, well, if you had willpower, you could lose weight. Let's say if you're overweight. And that isn't always true. And so what I'm saying is that there's a lot of energies that are working to hold people back. But when you put yourself in this place of unconditional love and you do your best to hold yourself there with your language with your choice of behaviors, what happens is then you become untouchable and you do bring up everyone else. But the clearing work is so important. I talk a lot about clearing work in one of my books called Reweaving the Fabric of Your Reality. And I don't know if you can see how beat up this book is, but you know I use it constantly. And mm -hmm. um, basically there there are a couple of youtube videos on how to clear yourself and we do have a team of people that do clearing work so that's like you know it's like you don't put dirty dishes on the table to have a fresh meal you clean the dishes and then you put them out you still can reuse the dishes um and then there's a there's one other thing and this is something that's very simple is to ask your angels or guides or whoever you pray to 
uh, is there something I need to do? Is there something that's standing in the way of my being, uh, you know, at this elevated level that I want to be at? And I did that. And mm -hmm. one day, many, a few years, quite a few years ago, I was told, well, it's the way you're driving. You know, you say, well, that guy's an idiot. Or, you know, what does he think he's doing? You know, that kind of stuff, right? Uh -huh. You see other drivers and you, you know, you react. I was driving in San Diego at the time. So it's quite a few years ago. And um, the traffic in California is uh, aggressive, let's just say. So I decided I had to do something proactive to break that habit. And that's what we all need to do. So in my case, I decided, I chose that I would start blessing those people. So I would say, oh, you know, that I'm calling in the dragons to help them get where they want to go. They're probably in a bigger hurry than me. And then after I started doing that, I started laughing because I realized I was blessing people that I didn't know and that were, you know, in the 3D world behaving um, inappropriately. And my blessing is probably going to help them level up. And, it, you know, it's like uh, just a series of things that we do. So if if everyone in our audience would just take a moment and ask the question, is there something I'm doing, some attitude of of um, expectation or entitlement that's causing me to behave a certain way that's outside of 5D, you know, show me and help me figure out a way to antidote it, not just stop, because stopping doesn't work in my book. We want to antidote it with something proactive. Right. That's, yeah, I, I love that. I wanted to ask you, though, how you talk about clearing work, and you did a lot, you say you have a lot of videos and we're going to put links every on the bottom of um when we post but is there any kind of advice you could give to somebody to do clearing work on their own oh yeah i in fact <clears throat> i have like three 10 minute videos mm -hmm. or eight minute videos that show you how to clear yourself and mm -hmm. you literally take a stainless steel knife and cut around the body and you make an invocation to Archangel Michael to escort mm -hmm. the entities or energies to a place of evolution or dissolution. I don't even say escort them, you know, the pit or anything like that, because that's polarity. But mm -hmm. I can say to a place of evolution or dissolution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting. There are fewer uh, outside energy interference in the world today than there were 20 years ago. But they're a little more fierce because they've been around a long time. So mm -hmm. it sometimes takes a little more. There's another thing that that I have found out that uh, is very interesting. And that is, l let's say you have a, a pain you, or you have a, a shoulder ache and you have a weak shoulder. So sometimes when you lift something funny and it kind of throws you out a little bit. And now you're sitting there kind of nursing that. And then your foot starts to hurt. Your ankle starts to hurt. Hmm. Okay. And you think to yourself, well, what next? Why is that hurting? I didn't do anything. I'm just sitting here. And the answer is that's an entity. They're taking advantage of the fact that you're in this self-care place of woundedness. And they're bringing in another wound, hoping that you will accept it. Oh. And all you have to do to get rid of that is very simple. You say, if you're 100% God light, you may say, if you're not of 100% God light, you must go now. And you just say it in a sincere way, if in a fierce way, if you can, softly, if you're with other people, and mm -hmm. it leaves right away. I think mm -hmm. they're, they're some kind of nanobot or something. I'm not sure what they are, but they feel mechanical. And so these energies are literally taking advantage of anybody who's compromised. So they sound like kind of arconic to me, if that's what you're mm -hmm. saying. They're mechanical, right? Um, can you say that? You know, if somebody's bothering you, if you're not 100% God life, hit the road. I mean. No, no, no because hit the road means they're going to leave you and jump on somebody else. Okay. So what do you say if somebody's annoying you, if you're not 100% God light? Okay. You're talking about a, another person, a human being? Yeah. Who may be annoying you. Yeah. What do you do? <laughs> if somebody's annoying you, you, the first thing you want to do is pull back. Right. Pull back your energy. And, you know, like those little dolls they used to have with where you could screw the hair in or out, you know, had long hair like yours. And right. then you could squeeze, you know, turn the key and it would shorten the hair. Did you? I don't, I always wanted I one. Did I did have, I had one of those. I had dolls. a Play Doh okay. version. I had it. I had, I had, okay. 
Very cool. Yeah. So, so you just pull your energy back and you literally feel, you know, our chakras go out pretty far and they have like threads and stuff. So, so when we, um, when we, uh, encounter a person well first of all if you know you're going to be with that person let's face it we're in the holidays and there might be a relative or two that irritate you and but you you feel like you want to be there for your family other family members that you do like so what you do before you go is you take and you take all those threads coming out of your solar plexus and you separate them out like pigtails and tuck it into the back the small of your back you know <laughs> and then you pull it out and you tie it in a square knot left over, right and under, and then right over, left and under, and then you tuck it into your waist. And if you're around somebody that, that you know, trips your trigger, you will be astounded at how doing that one thing before you can, before you spend time with them will change everything. And it's particularly, you know, uh, important for people who are with spouses that are sometimes annoying, but they haven't decided they want to you know, break up, they just, you know, don't want to put up with that craziness in that moment. Just tie off your, your threads from your solar plexus. Right. Because it's really looking for a plug-in. Um, mm -hmm. and, and exactly. Yeah. So you got to just close the receptor. Um, yeah. So, close the connection. Like, yeah. So what do you think about like just the frequency manipulations coming through our devices, coming through 5G? Because everything's so subtle, like you're saying, if we can be that override frequency and and rise above all of it, would you say that we can offset and dismantle this dark technology because we're in a consciousness that is above that? And and that can help disable some of these bioweapons that we can't really stop otherwise? Um, well, I totally agree with you. I have felt those bioweapons and I've had uh, awareness of what they are and what they're doing. And their primary message is forget, 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 reject, reject, reject. Now think about it. If somebody hears somebody who's cognitive and a good thinker, and they hear an explanation of something that happened that is counter to the public narrative right now, they may start to think about it. But then those airwaves are projecting, forget, forget, forget reject 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 so those two messages are riding on all the airwaves the wi-fi the cell phones the um uh internet that you know you get at home unless you're on hardwire and so we get bombarded with that and we get easily bamboozled or confused so one of it one of those things is to turn off your wi-fi at night if you can <clears throat> so that means I have my Wi-Fi on a timer. In addition, I call in an electronic, I say electronic meaning an etheric, Faraday cage around my bed and around my body every night, around my house and around my, um, my property line. Um, in my case, I have a neighbor whose Wi-Fi cuts into my bedroom. And even though we're not that close physically, apparently when they can't sleep, they turn up the Wi-Fi so they can listen to music or something. So, you know, I have other devices in place to antidote that. You know, you can buy lots of EMF devices, and I highly recommend that to wear them or to um, have them on your person. I keep a, a an ant an EMF device in my purse because the Wi-Fi in your car is pretty heavy duty. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of ways to rise above it. And and there is um, the physical component that pulls us in. So I'm I'm a little bit unclear if we can actually vibrate above it. I don't know. What do you think, Laura? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Yes, I, I mean... It's, it's a difficult one. I mean, and I think all those measures that you take are absolutely crucial, especially because we're so vulnerable on the astral. And if those devices are on and we're just like knocked out and we're in a deep sleep, people have crazy dreams. They wake up exhausted no matter how much rest they actually got. And there's a lot of entity attacks. And so, I mean, it just one has to be mindful and uh, counteract it as it comes in and... I just think that's been such a huge part of it. I mean, we grew up with the television. Not everyone was programmed by it, right? I think there's a certain immunity with more conscious and awake people that can feel the foreign energy and they're more sensitive to it. They don't just 
absorb it or be groomed by it. Um, so I just agree with what you're saying about holding that higher vibration because it's all going to be there. That's part of keeping us down. But um, I mean, I don't know if that kind of answers your question, but I mean, you do, you're doing a course, right? About uh, inviting the beloved in. It seems that a lot of yes. the manipulations are trying to prevent those unions from coming together. So it's so powerful to do a course like this. Can you talk to us about just that soul journey where that is such a huge part of it and you know how it needs this extra emphasis and focus so people can break through those negative patternings or codependency patterns with partners and to really meet that true beloved to really grow and thrive because i think that overrides so much in this world i agree part of uh part of uh the process is recognizing if you're not with a beloved you want to be with and while i'm not encouraging people to split with their partner. What I want to say is sometimes a partner is pretty good, but then there's other problems. And if you're on a mission to help save the planet, let's say, and you know that's part of your mission, even though if you don't know how you're going to do it, it may be that you can't move beyond the drama that you're living with. And so that's when you know you need to take a break. Now, the first thing in the package of the program that I teach on bringing the beloved is letting go of the one that you are with or the one you have left, because sometimes we're still filled with longing for the things that we did like about them. And so part of it is a, a guided meditation where you actually move into gratitude for all the good that came out of the relationship. And then I tell people a little joke, and the joke is like this. What do you call the previous partner of your beloved? Do you call her or him the ex? Do you call them uh, the former? Well, now you're being nice. The ex is you know, just kind of annoyed. And the uh, <laughs> former is you're trying to be nice but what if you said well your practice beloved taught you xyz isn't that funny oh that's interesting the practice beloved so he's <laughs> kind of, they're kind of like the warm-up to the real beloved right and you a person might have more than one practice beloved to get to that place where they're ready because mm -hmm. sometimes it's not just about the other person being wacko but about us, because the people who attract, for example, people who attract a narcissist are very loving and supportive of others. Mm -hmm. And they get sucked in because the narcissist is very good at whining and dining and, you know, making you feel special until they don't. And so <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to notice that. But it, once you've been with someone like that. Um, and there are people that I have counseled that have chosen to stay in those kind of relationships. Then they create what I call adaptive behaviors to, as workarounds. And they deliberately set things up in a certain way so that they're still in power, even though their partner thinks they're in power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of my favorite ways to do that is let's say you want to go on a trip together and you're thinking Aspen and they're thinking, um, Las Vegas. And mm -hmm. so uh you know they prefer Las Vegas. They they would prefer Las Vegas. So when you propose the trip, you say, you know, I think Las Vegas is the first choice. And I I think that's the best choice for us. Um, it would make you so much happier. Um, but you know, I really feel like Aspen. We could go skiing and meet some cool people. But probably, you know, the best choice is is Las Vegas. And you know what they'll choose. They'll choose. Aspen. Yeah, yeah. That's a good because way. To... They want to be right. They want to be the one to tell you you were wrong. Right. They do love telling you you're wrong. That's for sure. But, yeah, I but think if you set really... it up, if you yeah. deliberately set it up to make them choose what you want them to choose by deliberately playing up the opposite, uh -huh. it gets to be really funny. And they don't even know you're doing it. That's so funny. It's kind of like the narcissist, uh -huh. winning the narcissist game. It yeah, is strategizing it is. around the patriarchal programs. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, the, for a person who is discovering that they are the narcissist, and it does happen, or 
or maybe they don't even know they're the narcissist, but they want to make sure they're not. One of the ways to do this is a guided meditation I have called Mantras for Ascension. And it is the Hathor chant, um, a chant uh, sounding the names of the Hathors in the Hathor tongue, which is earth, air, fire, and water. And then clearing the field, which is the Kadosh chant. Many people know that is the chant that's used when um, people go to pray for their loved one who passed in the Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. So that that chant, um, the the El Kalim Om chant, opens your heart. It clears your pranic tube. And if a person, let's say, someone said, you know, well, you're a narcissist. That's why you're behaving this way. And you think, oh, oh my gosh. And and understand that a person becomes a narcissist at age two or two and a half when something happened that made them decide that life wasn't safe and they had to put themselves first in all circumstances. So they keep creating these behaviors. So it's not like they can control it in the sense that you and I might decide not to eat a donut. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a little bit of compassion here and recognize that these are behaviors that they've maladaptive behaviors that they created. So if a person were to be accused of being a narcissist, what what you would do is this chant, which opens the pranic tube, clears out those behaviors and opens your heart. And you don't need my CD to do it. There's, <laughs> I don't know how many times it's been taken off of YouTube because somebody added it, you know, for free. Uh, it's not a big deal. It's on my app, the f the phone app. We have a I you uh, iPhone and Android meditation app with all the guided meditations that I've made. So I did have a client one year that I worked with for a full year that I knew was somewhat in that behavior. I don't know how extreme she was, but I was, as a teacher, I was a little scared going in, knowing what I was getting into, if you follow that, you know, if you decided you were going to accept someone as a student, but my guidance was that I could do it. So one of the things that she did as a, as part of her practice was this meditation chant. And she emerged after that year and she was no longer a narcissist. Wow. Wow. So it is possible. Yeah. So a narcissist it, can cure themselves basically of their narcissism. They can, yeah. It, it's not easy, but wow. it is possible. Mm -hmm. well, but the, that, what that chant does is opens you up and opens your heart. And with the Hathor's presence, the Hathor's are the highest beings in our solar system. And they are beings of unconditional love and light. And because of that, when you're calling them in, then they kind of overlay you. So nobody can get to you. You know, they're like giant I'll call them like teddy bears or something. They're beautiful beings, but they're quite big and they don't let anybody hurt you. So you can actually heal. All right. So wait a second. You keep talking about the Hathors. Are you talking about Hathor, the Egyptian goddess Hathor? Mm -hmm. The Venus okay. energies, right? Venus segment. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to love Hathor because she's she was, she was so interesting. Are like there seven mother. Hathors? Or What's that? There's seven Hathors or... No. Well, I don't know. I think it's a whole community. I think it's a whole uh, group of beings. Mm -hmm. And Sekhmet was uh, in, in a little deviation because she was lioness as compared with bovine for most of the traditional uh, mm -hmm. Hathors. And Sekhmet came to me uh, on 9-11. And I had just left New York the day before. I had been told by my guides, you cannot stay like you planned. And so I had an airline ticket to go home on Monday, first thing. But wow. I didn't know why. And I broke appointments. And when people said, why are you going home? I said, I don't know. My higher self told me I need to go. So I'm going home. Wow. And, so you left September 10th. Yeah. And wow. so the next day, H Hathor came through as Sekhmet. And at that time... Uh, I I didn't know who Sekhmet was. Mm -hmm. And Sekhmet is the being that came out of the eye of Ra. Mm -hmm. um, and Ra and Ptah were partners. Mm -hmm. And he came out of the eye of Ra because um, 
there was so much misbehaving in humanity's behavior. So humans were excessively drinking and and all the other all the other vices, and they were not holding God in respect. So this is Ra sent for a segment. She came through and she got so carried away uh, punishing the humans that then they had to bring Thoth in to um, calm her down. And what he did is he gave her a drink that included alcohol. So she became inebriated and then they put a spell on her and she became Bastet. And this is all in the uh, tomb of Tutankhamun, this whole story, because it's yeah. one of the few um, uh, grave sites or, or tombs that wasn't destroyed by marauders and thieves and such. So it is a known story in the Egyptian uh, iconography. And so she's both the goddess of war and the goddess of love. I actually wrote about her in my book. I wrote about Sekhmet and Hathor and that whole story and about Sekhmet's bloodlust when she got carried away and they had to give her beer and and out of her all that wow yeah, yeah. so I love that story I mean yeah it's-, it's so amazing how you know you don't know the being and and they introduce themselves versus like researching it or just like you know invoking it and just how they just gravitate to you is so wonderful and amazing but uh, my question is kind of shifting gears a little bit it seems like it's almost impossible for parents these days uh, not to kind of go to some sort of war to protect their children from this next level indoctrination of gender confusion and, you know, race wars, Black Lives Matter, kind of victim consciousness, hate being white. I mean, how, how I mean, I know these are the kind of people that you like really assist and lift them out. But it takes such a radical change, like homeschooling, pulling your kids out of the system or being witness to it and and like having to, you know, maybe vote yourself into the school board to make a change. I mean, how can people navigate this when they have young children that are in these schools? Is there the hope that a bunch of star seeds are going to kind of awaken and be like, wait a second? I mean, how how do you sort of observe that realm of this next level insanity that's going on? Well, there's a there's a couple of vantage points, and the first one is it it doesn't serve to get into a battle unless you know you're supposed to be there, because sometimes you don't really have the strength or the wherewithal, but you might combine with others who will stand up and say, "Not on my watch." Um, I have felt this way for my family. And I, even though I wasn't a practicing Catholic, I enrolled them in Catholic school just to avoid that. And Mm -hmm. it's not easy for parents who have children that are wise beyond their years, wise beyond what we know, but that's the generation that we're raising. So in part, it's incumbent upon the parents to instill upon their children what they see as the norm, and then to make room for the child to revert to their own knowledge base. For example, when a parent says, well, when I was your age, I solved it this way, they're deliberately setting the child up to find another way. And um, there's all kinds of information today being exposed on how this gender dysphoria is being promoted at a very young age, So I truly don't know what the answer is, but I do know that parents have an obligation to teach their children what they know. And just because they don't go to church doesn't mean they can't teach them something. We set aside in our house every Sunday to do our own prayer work and our own um, spiritual teaching. And when Somebody knocked on the door one Sunday morning and asked, you know, if they could talk to us and share the Bible and such. I said, well, we're in the middle of something. You know, I I really don't have time right now. And they asked, well, what are you doing that's so important? And I said, well, we're having our church service. And they said, you can't have church at your house. Why? And I said, I said, says who? 
Who says that? You know, the early Christians met at their homes. They sure did. The Gnostics were definitely meeting in their homes and having yeah. meetings. And so anyway, God. then then they said, well, can we come back later? And I said, well, you're welcome to come back later if you're willing to give me equal time. <laughs> then you come back. <laughs> so, you know, it's little things like that, you know, and like we're, right now we're in the holiday season um, and people are caught up in gift giving. And what a parent can do is, especially if they're not into the Christian scene per se, is to say that early times, early civilizations celebrated the return of the light because they knew December 21st was when the light started to get bigger and, and longer days again. And so part of that celebration was gift giving. So that's why we celebrate. And some people call it Christmas. Some people call it Festival of Lights and so on. And so they, you know, you can share what you believe without making all the other ones wrong. And that's the trick because they're all valid experiences. And frankly, if we're, if we're beings on a planet and we're only one of millions of beings on planets, how could we possibly have the only avatar? Mm -hmm. So um, part, you know, part of what's happening is the world is changing and we're, 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 our children are getting educated in the schools, but you can educate your children by the movies you watch and watch with them and pick movies that you know will convey what you believe in. And here's a tip. This is something I didn't know before uh, I met my husband, and that is there's a group of movies called Tamil movies or Indian movies, and start watching those because they're amazing. They always have difficulty, and how they resolve it is very interesting. And the 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 shows are always very um very thematic. You know, there's something going on with the family or with a boy meets girl. They you know they come together, fall in love, and then something big happens that causes them to split apart. And then how they think themselves through the resolution. And it's quite amazing because there there isn't a lot of sex. I mean, there isn't any, you know, like physical sex like we get inundated with. There's no body parts that are being uh, exposed. And I think that's pretty important because, you know, we're desensitizing our kids when we expose them to that stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole body of knowledge that we can um, acquire and experience. Now, I wouldn't expose my children to the sound of freedom because that's almost scary for the kids. But there's a Tamil version of that. And I, you know, I don't know what it's called right now, but there's all kinds of what I would call Indian style movies. There's millions of people who speak the language Tamil in India. Mm -hmm as well as the traditional Indian language. So it's it's very interesting to me. They hold a much bigger respect for the human body, the human psyche. And I learn something every time I watch one of those films. That's interesting. I've never heard of that before. So it's Tamil, T-A-M-I-L. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Okay, that's good yeah. to know. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask, um, I'll ask Abhinayan to pick out a few titles for you that you can watch. And then what will happen is, you know, Apple Play will, I don't know if it's Apple Play, but one of those AIs will start offering you those movies. Mm -hmm. See, so, and some of them are, are you know, you have to watch with um, translation, but they're mm -hmm. still good, good cinematography, good film work. You know, so there's no reason to not watch them. And I mean, it's uplifting stuff. And the same with stories. You know, do we read our kids any stories? And the stories we read the kids help them understand the life we're growing into and the life they're growing into. Um, and that's that's really important because the kids are getting indoctrinated. So they need to know what you think. Now, going back to what I was saying before about giving your children space to make a decision. What I mean by that is by the time your children hit age 13 or so, they've absorbed all the mores from you they can. And if you're setting a good example, 
they will know, quote, the right thing to do or the thing that they ought to do in a situation. Now, when they tell you about a difficult situation and you say, well, blah, 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 they are going to do the opposite because they need to stand up and show you that they're grown up. If, however, you already announced to them they're grown up by saying, how are you going to do that? How are you going to take care of that? What is your plan? They'll tell you everything. And it always puts them into that zone of stuff they know they learned from you. Mm -hmm. So, So making room for your children to make their own decisions without sharing what you did is one of the biggest challenges of a parent that there is because you want it, you you need to put on your adolescent hat. You can't be the the mom hat that you used to have where you just gave advice and told them what to do. Because children think think through. I saw a video just the other day on on um I think it was TikTok but it was also reposted in in um uh, LinkedIn and it was this 2-year-old and I bet you it's been around for years cuz I think I saw it once before. 2 or 3-year-old was talking and he's saying how um, he was really mad and upset because he couldn't go outside. And, you know, he was angry at first. And then he thought about it and he realized that, you know, he was sad because he really wanted to go outside. And after a while, he said, you know, I I figured out that I could get over being sad and and make myself happy. And this is like a three-year-old and he can't possibly be parroting his parents. He's parroting right. what he's learned, but he's not parroting what the parents are telling him because he's not old enough to be an actor. It's quiet. Well, it's interesting that that child realized that his emotions were a choice and his happiness was a choice. And so- I think that's something his parents taught him because he also said at the end of that clip, um, sometimes daddy doesn't get his way and he gets upset. Mm-hmm. Sometimes mommy doesn't get her way. She gets unhappy. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, it's like a healthy respect. And I will tell you as a mother, mm-hmm. it never occurred. Nobody gave me any education in this. And it, you know, we didn't have those things when, when my kids were little. And I didn't know that children had to learn how to handle their emotions. It was not in my you know, range of thinking, you know, you you had your kids early too, Laura. So maybe you had a similar experience, but I remember observing these big emotions and thinking, what do we do with that? What's going on here? Especially when it's all the same time, it's just like, ah. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So it it was like an aha moment for me. Oh, I have to teach my children how, what emotions are, and how to handle them, which I had not done at that point. Wow, it's incredible. I mean, it's amazing just how much you have have given of your knowledge and wisdom to humanity with six books, the mystery school, you got courses coming up. And it's just so incredible to see just this constant flow going on. And I, I know you use all these techniques, of course, and it's like obvious it freaking works just being in your presence. Um, I know you have some things coming up and, uh, and if you want to talk to us about just the mystery schools and just what you do there in Sedona, that'd be really amazing to listen to. Um, I wasn't planning on moving to Sedona and one of my people sent me uh, a note on um, WeChat saying, my guide told me you need to start your school in Sedona. And so we were right in the middle of COVID. And she said, I was told to send you this money. And she sent me a substantial amount of money, not enough to start a school, but you know, enough to pay attention to. So I, um, <clears throat> I was invited to do a school. I was invited to do an event that was going to be outdoors during COVID. And that's when I looked and moved. So the school is online courses. It's also live courses over zoom and then also in-person trainings with the Ascension Institute and also a new program that we're going to be introducing next year. So the school itself is a body of knowledge that I'm trying to uh, bring forward for people. So there's classes on sacred geometry. There's a class on sound healing by another teacher that I respect. There's um, classes on 
bringing in the beloved. And, you know, we didn't get very far in bringing in the beloved, but I'll give you one big hint, um, Marissa, since you're in the marketplace. Um, Thank you. <laughs> the bringing in the beloved is a, um, the ideal thing to do mm -hmm. is to get a journal and start writing love letters to your beloved and I keep that, that journal, keep your journal separate. And make it a nice one, you know, a fancy one, maybe. They have a lot of fancy ones this time of year. And mm -hmm. the only thing you write in that is your love letters. And it's as if you've met, but you're not together in this particular moment. So, you you know, it, you're missing each other, but you're happy that you've had this connection. And you start imagining all these things that you have in common and that you love about each other. And it'll attract, it'll attract either a practice beloved that you need some work on or it'll attract the beloved that you need to be with. And either case, it's a win-win because it's very beneficial. Now, the class I'm going to be teaching live in December is called the Akashic Records, opening the Akashic Records. And it's both level one and two. Level one is opening your own records and level two is opening the records for others. And what I did for a very special opportunity for people is to bring a friend for half price. So if you want to uh, get your friend to come to this class and they're kind of interested, but they're not sure, you you know, you know buy their ticket and then you gift it to them as a gift. And then last night, my guides came in and said, make a friend. So if you don't have any friends that you know of that you want to sponsor and you have the resources to sponsor someone, go ahead and do that. And we'll match you with someone who has written us and asked, is there, are, are there any scholarships? And so it's a way to make a friend. And we would, you know, introduce you and say, this person sponsored you. I and love so I'm that. I'm excited about that. Yeah. That's really exciting because I've always wanted to, you know, look at my Akashic records and I was wondering how to possibly do that. So this is a really great way of accessing them. Yeah, it truly is. And it's, you know, um, the way we teach, the way I teach is dramatically different than anyone else, because as a mystic, I'm not just teaching you about the Akashic Records. I'm teaching you a bigger body of knowledge that supports your work in the Akashic Records. And that's not only is it really cool to get that kind of knowledge, but it's a lot of fun. And we do have a lot of fun in the classes. So, you know, it's it's quite amazing, truly amazing. I want to ask you when you oh obviously you've opened your Akashic records. Mm -hmm. So when you did that, what was the biggest thing you learned? Like what was what's a highlight? I mean, I'm sure there's been there are a lot, but is there anything you can tell us? Or? Well, one of the things that happens when you open the Akashic records for yourself is mm -hmm. they they always address you in a sweet, loving way. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, um, something like, you know, you've been really taking good care of yourself. We're so proud of you that you're getting a good rest at night and that you're spending time meditating. Now to your question. So they're always like super superlative and loving. And no matter what they tell you, it's going to be loving. So for example, one of my students, uh, a, a therapist had quit her job abruptly. And she kept telling the company that she worked for that they were scheduling her too tightly and she didn't have time to write the reports for the patient's reimbursement before she had to deal with the next one. And she didn't like staying late after all her appointments. And she didn't think she, that was fair because she only got paid per client. She didn't get paid for all the paperwork. At least that's her thinking. Mm -hmm. And so she asked in the records, you know, what did they have to say about her recent you know walking out and they said in a very sweet well way um you could go back and apologize that it never occurred to her she was still fuming <laughs> uh, oh my gosh so they're really amazing really amazing and anybody can get in the records no matter who you are you can get in the records and even if you think you're the least plugged in of all the people you know doesn't matter because there's a dispensation that lets everybody to come in as long as they're willing to have a sincere request to be in the records. Wow. That's so cool. That is so cool. Gosh, it, it's been so wonderful to spend this time with you and Marissa, is there any questions that you still have or 
um, Maureen, are there any things that we haven't asked you that you feel important to share with us? Marissa, I have, well, I do have something I want to share, but I'll wait. Okay, I just wanted to ask you, um, when you say they, who who is in control of the Akashic records? Like who the are Akashic they? records are a uh, uh, it's a body of knowledge that oh. is accessed by mm -hmm. Akashic records guides or beings. Okay. Some of those beings are permanent residents of that area. And mm -hmm. others float in and out. Mm -hmm. I've even had a student who had been in the records in, in another incarnation of herself. And her name reflected it. Oh, really? And really interesting. Her work was very, very high. Mm -hmm. um, so the record keepers are anonymous. But they are beings that are assigned to that or have taken that assignment. And then they don't. We don't go into the records. We don't go into that library. We actually meet up with those beings at the threshold. Because if you were in the records where you saw the person you're married to murder you, you might react while you're in the records. And that would make this horrible time loop thingy. So you never are actually inside the records. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's one thing. Um, now, for my parting thought, if you will, during this holiday season, give yourself the gift of asking for something totally amazing. And this totally amazing thing is I'm asking for a day of heaven on earth for me and anyone I'm in contact with and anyone I'm in contract with. And that changes everything. Ooh. That's so beautiful. Wow. What great timing to have you here just in this time of... It's just families coming together, just handling a lot of different energy. And there's a lot of overlays on these very significant dates too. <laughs> and just, mm -hmm. and so it's just really wonderful to be in your presence as always. And Thank I you. look forward to seeing you at the next event. Uh, I just love being on panels with you and just seeing you at your booth and all that you do is just so beautiful. And you're blessing humanity in such huge ways. So thank you so much, Maureen. <laughs> And back at you, you guys are doing just as much good work in your way by doing these programs. It's really very special. Thank you. I really want to just reiterate what Laura said so eloquently, as always. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I just, uh, it's been a real joy speaking with you, Maureen, again. And I just love what you said about a day of heaven. I think we should manifest heaven on earth i love that so much we do that and all good things for you really you bring and... the confidence back to people really just that empowerment is just gosh and just the frequency you hold too is just whoa so <laughs> much love have wonderful much love the year and happy, happy holidays year happy, happy holiday. new year mm -hmm. okay, bye, take care guys. bye bye